So, fun to be with you tonight. Thank you to ELN and to Provost Green and, and Dara Dean, uh, John. Um, so, there was this uh, girl, and she was, uh, it was Sunday night, and so uh, she didn't want to go to school the next day. So she says to her mom, I I'm, I'm have a stomach ache. And her mom says, oh, honey, you'll be fine by morning. And it gets to morning. It's early in the morning. And she wakes her mom up. And she says, Hi, my stomach aches so bad, I just can't go to school today. And you know the typical thing, money of her parents here. And so her mom said, well, honey, what's really going on? And she said, well, no one really likes me that much at school. School is really hard. I don't really want to go to school today. And mom said, well, honey, you're the principal. <laughs> That's sort of the dilemma we're all in, right? <laughs> so I want to talk today about SEL, but I want to talk about it in the context of a bigger picture, which is what it means to have a healthy, caring school. Because That's really what the goal is here. So there was a guy uh, walking along a beach uh, in Oregon. He's a psychologist, of course. And um, he's walking along a beach, taking a walk, and he kicked uh, what we thought was a rock, but turned out it was like a little lamp, and a genie popped out. And the genie said, you, you've released me from the lamp. You can have one wish and any wish you want. So the guy thought for a while, and he said, well, I, I never really could do this. I'd love to take my whole family to Hawaii but I just can't afford the flights. Could you build a highway to Hawaii? And the genie starts thinking, and the genie says, well, you know, it's a lot of concrete, and I don't know, it's, the ocean's very deep. I, you know, and he starts hamming and hawing, and, 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 and finally says, I, I don't really know if I can do that. And so the, the psychologist says, well, then, how about this? How do we create systems change to create healthy and caring schools in which SEL is the center of all education? And the genie says, do you want a one-lane or a two-lane highway? <laughs> so this is complicated. I mean, if it wasn't complicated, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be, have the problem that we, we are in right now. And I, I began my work in this in 19, 1980 because I was trained as a clinical psychologist working with kids. I was at the University of Washington as a professor. And I realized that there's no way we're going to ever tend to stem the tide of more children having clinical problems unless we create better conditions, preventive conditions that create healthy, caring environments for children. And schools often fundamentally are toxic environments for many kids. We just have to recognize that. That's the way it is. Many of us grew up in what we'd probably call toxic educational environments. And um, it's difficult to change conditions in schools. Systems change in schools, as we know, is really complicated. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a walk today uh, through evidence-based programs, but I want to talk about teachers and their well-being. I think it's a central issue, and I want to talk about principals and their well-being and the broader issue of how do we change systems. Because if we think too narrowly about this, I'm quite sure we'll fail. Okay? And I'll tell you, give you an example of that. My first 20 years, I did randomized trials. So I'm a public health scientist. I do randomized trials. I would take a, a school district and pick 10 schools and principals would agree to be involved, and they would, uh, they, I'd randomize them. Half the schools would get the SEL program, and half the schools would not. Uh, we'd uh, uh, interview the teachers, interview the kids, give lots of supervision and support, and the data would come out. I'd publish articles in, in peer-reviewed journals showing that the program worked. It improved children's uh, well-being, it improved their engagement and learning in the classroom, and it, it decreased their serious behavior problems. And I'd go back three years later, and there was no curriculum in spite of the fact that everybody said they liked it. And that's because there was no infrastructural support to really create long-term process change. And so after my first 20 years at, at the University of Washington, I went to Penn State with a goal to actually figure out how the real world works. Randomized trials are great. They can prove that things can work. But how does the real system work? How does money flow? How do people think? How do schools actually behave? Can we actually get this, to get this right? Okay, that's, that's the question. And I don't have the answers. I don't think anybody has uh, uh, the answers, and there isn't one single answer. But I'll tell you what some of my thoughts are about this after 40 years of, of doing this. And I should first say that 
because I'm uh, the, the developer of a curriculum and I get some royalties from it, I want to disclose that that's the case. So I'm going to talk about current status of SEL research and practice, a little bit about the crisis of teaching, which I think is a fundamental crisis, um, and what we can learn from teachers and administrators, and the pathways, I think, towards creating uh, more caring, compassionate schools. So before I go anywhere, I try to read things and watch things, and um, I came across this report, which is um, uh, scary when you read it. How many of you have actually read this report? Right, so the report came out in earlier this year, I think, in Oregon. And uh, not, don't think I'm pointing to Oregon with a finger, because this could be any state in the nation. But um, that we have a lot of issues to, to solve. And I think SEL is one part of a larger set of solutions. So what is SEL? Well, you probably all know this already. I won't spend much time. But it's a process through which we acquire and we use fundamental skills that help us to manage our emotions, set positive goals and achieve them, get along with others, feel and show empathy and compassion, maintain positive relationships. Isn't that what our whole adult struggle is? Uh, Oscar Wilde once said, only the, what did he say? Only the naive understand themselves. And what he meant by that is across our entire lives, our, our greatest challenge is our relationships with others, right? Anybody here isn't challenged by their relationships? Anyone here? Okay. And, and how do we maintain these positive relationships? How do we manage conflict? How do we communicate and persuade? Right? How do we work in groups? And now, of course, industry and career, college and career readiness is all about this because this is what industry is interested in. And how do we make responsible decisions within, a, within an ethical framework, within the idea that we are citizens in a democracy that are working together, although that's in question right now. So I have been one of the founders of CASEL. It's an organization in Chicago. Uh, our goal is to make SEL a central part of all education by advancing the science, uh, advancing the practice, and improving, improving policy. And Oregon's one of the states that's involved in the, in the Castle States Initiative, and um, I don't think there's any school districts actually in the Castle District Initiative right now in Oregon. But there are 20, 25, Claire? 21 districts in the nation that are part of it. So you've probably seen something like this before. It's the castle wheel. And basically, there's the internal, the in, intrapersonal aspects of, of, uh, of social emotional learning, which is being able to manage yourself and um, have self-control to recognize your emotions and mindsets and attitudes, strengths, and weaknesses. There's the interpersonal part of it, which is getting along with others and showing empathy and compassion being able to form positive relationships, work in teams, et cetera. And then there's the making ethical choices, using your thinking skills within an ethical context to make uh, effective and healthy personal decisions. It's all great. Uh, you have to think about there being another dimension coming out of here, which is a third dimension, which is development, so that what those skills would look like in a four-year-old are very different than they, what they look like in a teenager. So in teenagers, we talk more about identity and identity development. We talk about um, growth mindset, if you will. Maybe grit, although I think it's not worth talking much about it myself. Um, but but we, we want to think about these from a developmental standpoint. There's a scope and sequence here. So for example, when we teach uh, about jealousy to first graders, if you've been a first grade teacher, you know, there's a lot of jealousy going on in the classroom. But it's about your shoes. or um, Someone's got a nicer bike or whatever. But in fourth and fifth grade, jealousy is about something very different. It gets to be very much so about gossip. It's about who gets invited to whose birthday parties. It has a very different feel. So even in just any emotion we think about, emotions also develop over time as, as cognitions get more complicated, right? So we have to think about this from a developmental standpoint. So first, I'll ask you a poll with two questions. First question is, do you think SEL has been convincingly shown to improve kids' social, emotional, and academic competence? Do you think so? Hands up. Okay, so mostly true believers here. Okay. And there's pretty good data. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty critical scientist, but there's the meta-analysis with uh, 270,000 students, uh, all, all pretty much in the U.S., all different kinds, mostly urban, but also the urban and uh, suburban and rural kids, showing that uh, overall in randomized trials mostly and some quasi-experimental studies, that, um, uh, that SEL 
as, as you'd expect, improve social emotional skills. Of course, it's, that's teaching to the test in a way. If we didn't do that, it would be a total failure. Uh, improves kids' attitudes about themselves and their schools. Uh, it improves classroom behavior. But uh, what's made policymakers interested in this is the 11% uh, gain in standardized testing. I think that's great, but we should be doing social emotional learning not because it improves academics, but because we want a healthy set of citizens. And it, of course, it reduces kind of problems and emotional problems. And there's a follow-up meta-analysis that then looks six months later and finds almost very similar things. Uh, I've done a study uh, that's, uh, that's followed children from age five to age 25 in, in uh, four cities in the United States, in Nashville, Durham, three towns in rural Pennsylvania, and in Seattle, in which we gave teachers an eight item, just an eight item, took about two minutes, uh, rating in kindergarten of children's uh, abilities to get along with others. Self-control, social-emotional confidence, eight items. And then we followed the kids to age 25. And you would say, well, maybe there's a relationship between what, how kids behave in kindergarten or first grade and age 25, but it's a real result of their, their home life. Were they, were, they, were they poor? Were they disadvantaged? Was there trauma? Were they, a, were they growing up in a single-parent home? Was their IQ low? Did they have poor reading achievement? And that's what's causing these outcomes. So this is a very careful, highly statistical study in which we controlled for all those things. We controlled for the quality of the home environment, the, quality, the, the nature of the family structure, uh, the child's IQ, the mother's IQ, the child's reading achievement, and the child's behavior problems. And after we controlled for all those, we looked at how the teacher's rating of social emotional competence, getting along with others, and having self-control predicted. And it predicted everything. It predicted did they graduate from high school? Did they graduate from college? Were they holding a full-time job? How often they'd been arrested? Were they medicated from grade one to 12? And were they living in public housing or not? Okay, so net of their behavior problems, even their conduct problems, there's not, a, not, there's not that great a relationship between conduct problems and social confidence because very few children have serious conduct problems. But social confidence is a, is, is, is a, is a normal curve, right? There's lots of variation. And that variation predicted all of those outcomes, even when we looked at kids' reading achievement, their IQ, their behavior problems, their family status, their gender, their ethnicity, all those factors. So there's something powerful about this, and anyone as a principal knows because you know the kids that show up in your office every day, or at least once a week. It's not because of their intelligence, right? It's because of their ability to get along with others and regulate their emotions. And we know as adults that the people that we have best friendships with are those that are able to give to us and listen and are able to think, and think carefully and compassionately about us uh, and able to be vulnerable, right? But if they talk about themselves all the time, they're the neurotic type, or they never talk about themselves, it's very hard to develop close relationships, right? So these are fundamental human qualities that relate to how kids do as adults, but also how, uh, how they do as children. So the second question is, uh, um, sorry, is, uh, is about economic value. Have we shown the economic value of SEL? And we have. There's data that shows uh, overall from five SEL curriculums that about $1 invested leads to about $11 return. So these are, in a sense, cost effective. And that $1 invested is not just on buying curriculums. It's on quality training for teachers, ongoing quality training. Is SEL basically a program used by teachers in a classroom? What do you think, yes or no? No, thank you. Speaking to the confirmed here, no. Programs are a critical component. Teaching kids skills are critical. If we just create these nice schools where everybody's friendly, that's great, but it doesn't show, teach children the skills that are necessary. If we have great skills that are very friendly, schools that are very friendly, does it help kids to read? Well, maybe a little bit, but you have to teach them the skills of reading, right? It's the same fundamental issue for SEL. Programs are a critical component, but systems change at the level of classrooms and schools, has many more processes, many more components and actions. The evidence-based curriculum are central. We know that's the case, but if we think about SEL as just the programs, we're, we're totally missing the boat. And what will happen is what happened in my first 20 years. People will try them, they'll like them, we'll show good outcomes, and there'll be no, no change. So when Castle thinks about this, we think about it broader. We think about the 
fact that there is this fundamental component of these skills that are taught through a curriculum and instruction. But then there's school-wide policies and practices. And these are not just practices and policies for kids. These are practices for the adults. And not only the adults in the school, but for the after-school programs, the out-of-school programs, and for parents and community partnerships. That is, it's a much broader fundamental issue that we're thinking about. It's how to create healthy, caring schools. So I've been doing this for a long time. What are the issues in creating a caring school? Well, I think the fundamental thing is that uh, both adults and children need good emotion regulation skills. Because like kids don't show up in the, in the, in the principal's office or in MSST if they have good emotion regulation skills. This is a really a fundamental human quality. And when people have these skills, uh, they do much better in every way. It's the master skill that underlies competence, is the ability to regulate your emotions. That means not always to control them, right? But to be able to regulate them. The second is schools, as, as communities, need to adopt what I'd call created shared communities of, of caring, of really creating healthy norms in the safe environments. This is really a, a, a leadership issue in a way. But it's one in which teachers and parents need to be empowered to work together to create the kind of shared community of caring that they, they want in their schools. This can include high quality SEL curriculum. It can include mindfulness, I think, for youth, not for kids probably, but for youth. That's the question I'll answer in the, answer in the, in the question period. Learning how to express caring and gratitude for everyone in buildings. Service learning, I think, is a critical component for adolescents. I think it's a, a great way for them to learn and feel part of a, of, of, of a democracy and, and develop citizenship and SEL skills. But to do this requires principal leadership at the building level. This is the fundamental, I think, linch, linchpin to create the kind of change we want. And that is at the level of principals. And I'll come back to them later because they are the ignored part of this process. But this requires systems planning at the board level. This means school boards need to think about fundamentally what they want their schools to be like and how they plan, how they relate to, to administrators, how they plan from a fiduciary standpoint for a long-term change. The school boards have been, often been ignored as a central part of this. I was talking with Rita, Rita, where are you? Rita earlier about this. School boards are thing, something that have, uh, as most school board members don't know much about SEL at all or why it's important or how it could create the kind of schools that they want that we don't have. So we have to understand the right conditions to thrive because you can do all the great things. The principals can have great ideas, superintendents can create departments, schools can buy curriculums, there can be lots of training, but unless the conditions are really right, uh, this won't thrive. And so we have to understand what it means to thrive because we already know the evidence. The evidence is already there. The evidence is there in, in the empirical evidence-based randomized trials. The evidence is there in the cost savings. But that doesn't mean that schools can easily adopt these and do them well without really thinking through and planning carefully. As Yogi Berra says, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. Right? OK, so let's go to the classroom level first. So on a classroom level, this is a castle, we castle called th uh, three-legged stool. We think there's three components here. There is the supportive classroom environment. You want to have an environment that's supportive, where teachers are creating norms of caring in the classroom, uh, where their discipline is appropriate and not punitive. We need explicit SEL instruction, especially in the elementary years, but even later on. And we need to integrate SEL with the rest of instruction, especially with language, arts, social studies, but even easily integrated with math and STEM. And when we see a really well-functioning school from an SEL standpoint, we see those three, three things happening. Teachers feel empowered to do effective discipline. It's not punitive. They're teaching SEL instruction in ways that kids are learning the skills, and it's integrated with the rest of instruction. Okay? And some of the SEL curriculums, like the one I developed, tries to do that by integrating it into, into social studies, integrating it into language arts and writing. Now, there's lots of guidance for picking these programs. Uh, I'm one of the founders of CASEL. Claire Shoes here from CASEL. CASEL has guides, and they're updating the guides right now of what are effective programs. And those are more like consumer reports. It's not just a, a matter of did their research turn out to, to show effects, 
But also, if you look carefully at those guys, it talks about, do they have a family component? Do they have a whole school component? Uh, do they have appropriate training, et cetera? And that's the kind of things you'd want to look at. There's also the Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. It's out of the University of Colorado. They have much more stringent criteria. In fact, uh, only two programs meet their criteria for uh, elementary school uh, SEL programs right now. I'm the developer of the PAS curriculum, which has evolved over many, many years. When I was a young professor at the University of Washington, I was interested in deaf children and their mental health. And the PAS curriculum started as a curriculum just for deaf children, social emotional competence, and sign language, uh, where I did randomized trials in the early 80s. And then slowly it evolved for whole schools. And now it's, uh, I think it's in somewhere around 5,000 schools in about 30 countries. So I've learned a fair amount of, of, about how to do this. And mostly I've learned it directly from teachers and principals. You don't learn this sitting in your lab. You learn this by being out and seeing all the things that, that go wrong. So PAS is just an example, but there's a, a dharmic statement, if you will, uh, living the golden rule. The golden rule is, is the key issue here. Uh, if we could just do that, if we could just treat others the way we want to be treated, um, that would be great. But there's a lot of developmental skills in getting to that point. Uh, as you know, we're st many of us are still working on it, right? <laughs> there's awareness of emotional states in ourselves and others. There's learning how to put feelings into words which is especially difficult for the male species, right? No one laughs about that? Come on. <laughs> but there is really good neuroscience on this. In fact, if you Google putting feelings into words, you'll see a great study by Matthew Lieberman at UCLA in which he put people in a magnet. Uh, and um, he showed them pictures of emotions of angry and sad and happy. And he watched what happened in their brains. And what happens is when you see the picture of angry or fearful, your amygdala, which is sort of the uh, it's a detector of threat. It's not the emotion center of the brain like people say. It's just not true. But it, it's, a, it's a part of the brain that detects threat. It's, it gets, becomes highly activated in minute, milliseconds. But then he did, randomly, he paired the, the, the face of the emotion of fear or sadness, and he put the word underneath it. So when you saw, you're in the man, you're looking up at the picture, and it's the same picture, but now it has the word fear or scared, or it has sad. As soon as the word label is attached to the emotion, the amygdala goes down and the frontal cortex begins to become active. Right? And we know this. This is what kindergarten teachers right? know. Use your words. Use your words. Because when people can have emotional granularity, it means they have many words for emotions. Both children and adults are both physically and mentally healthier. This is the issue of emotional granularity is a really important concept. If any of you are interested in reading more about it, Lisa Barrett Feldman is the, the great emotion scientist in, in this area. Just giving people lots of vary, varying words for the different aspects of emotion is so important. So when a child is upset and they tell you they're angry, well, are they a little bit peeved? Are they really uh, intensely angry? Right? Are they really feeling disappointed? Are they feeling jealous? What is it they're actually feeling? Right? Being able to have the granularity to actually specify more about your emotions is criti critically important. The ability to calm yourself down when feeling highly aroused, right? That's why they are in the office. Uh, planning ahead, using your planning skills to think ahead, what's, grown, what's, what's around the curve, especially in adolescence, is critical. And developing greater empathy and compassion for others. These are all skills that can be taught, just like we can teach math or reading or, or any other subject. When I started this work in 1980, my colleagues came to me, my senior colleagues, and they said, don't waste your career on this. It's just a matter of personality. Some people have difficult temperaments. Some people are easy. Some people are friendly, and some people are not, and you can't change it. But there's fundamental evidence to show that that's just not true. Even though we all have temperaments, we all can learn how to do things a bit better and become more consciously aware, especially if we learn it when we're young. So in PAS, we start with little kids. We start with uh, Head Start, three, four, three, four year olds, public, public primary schools. And uh, we teach them steps for calming down. And we use the metaphor of a turtle who, who gets, uh, has a lot of problems. He has a lot of friends. He gets in a lot of trouble. And he learns that he can go inside his shell. And when he goes inside his shell, it's quiet. And he can think, what can I do? And he does this. And when he does this or she does this, he can't get, can't get in any trouble. It's a signal to the teacher that I'm having a problem. I want to talk about it and it signals to other kids to 
that I'm struggling or I need to, need to have some time. And so we teach this to young kids as they get a little bit older. The, the turtle teaches them the three steps for calming down. Usually it requires taking more than one long deep breath, depending on how upset you are. And those three steps are what's in the later the control signals poster, the red light, which is how to stop when you have a problem, identify what you're feeling, uh, what can you do, and then try your, your plan. Now that's the simple version. That's the version that we put all, all over schools, maybe on the playgrounds and in the lunchroom. Um, and as kids get older, we break this down more. So in fourth and fifth grade, we begin to, begin to begin to break down, and we have lessons on each of those skills. How to identify our problems. It's pretty complicated, actually, identifying problems. How to identify people's feelings. Oftentimes, we misidentify them. How to think of solutions. How to consider consequences. How to, how to do all that stuff. Because, you know, it's all important. We all do it sort of quickly and unconsciously. Um, but usually, we do it, and we come up with one great idea, right? And we try the one great idea, and it doesn't work, and then we get really mad, and we seek revenge. Okay? This is the problem of the kids in MST often. It's not that they don't know one good idea. It's that they try their one good idea, and when it doesn't work, now they feel justified. Don't we ever feel that in our marriages? You know, right? You do one really nice thing, and you really try hard, and it doesn't work, and you think, well, now I'm really going to tell her what I feel. Right? So adults are not that different than kids. So the issue is not just that you can do this stuff, not memorize it, but do it, but if, what happens when it fails, right? Because all kids, even the kids that are most aggressive and disruptive, can tell you the good solutions. And oftentimes they can carry out one, right? But it's what happens when it fails. And that's what you see with kids that have disruptive behavior. They, they often know one good idea, for example, of how to enter a group. But when it fails, they break down. Right? It's an emotion regulation problem. Right? It's not just a thinking skills problem. So PAS is just one example. We've done many studies, or 11 randomized trials in seven different countries, showing that if you do this well, with high quality training, you can increase kids' attention and engagement and improve their peer relations. And you can improve their executive functions. You know, that's an important idea these days. In fact, we've shown that there's a mediational process that executive functions improvement is what leads to lower rates of behavior problems. As kids get more ability to plan ahead, they show fewer problems. And lower rates of aggression and sadness and, and, and good cost effectiveness. So this is just an example. And that's in randomized trials where we're just picking schools, schools that don't have systems change processes, schools that haven't planned ahead. Right? So what do we learn from this? Well, across many evidence-based programs, fidelity matters. And we've, we've shown, for example, we did a study uh, with 72 elementary schools in Cleveland. Cleveland's a pretty tough place. And um, what, we show, what, what an independent um, research group showed was that um, the more teachers implemented the program, the lower the rates were of aggression and attentional problems in the classroom, and the more kids became engaged. But if teachers implemented it poorly, it had no effect at all. So it's a waste of money, time, and energy to buy a bunch of curricula that sit on the shelves because teachers aren't trained well enough to do it. It's better to, instead of buying 100 curricula, buy 10 and train the teachers and let them become really competent at it and do it well. Because fidelity really matters. It's been shown over and over and over again. Right? That um, if this is something where you're just checking it off your list, um, it's, it's going to fail, right? We, we know this is not any different than reading our math curriculum, right? But if we're serious about it, that it means we really train teachers, we support them, we nurture them to become really good at these skills. The best outcomes are high fidelity practitioners, and high fidelity means careful attention to implementation. And that means that it's not an online two-hour video training. It's a training by someone who's, who's skilled, who understands the context of the school and the culture, comes more than once, right? We know, we know uh, Linda Darling Hammond's work and others on training is that one day of training for anything is just a waste of time. How many times have you actually implement something you learned in a one day training? It's really rare. But if you know there's gonna be three trainings during the year and, and, and it's gonna be tracked and people are gonna think together and work together on it, it totally changes the idea of implementation. Okay. 
So that's the classroom. And there, the, these evidence-based programs are important, but they're just a small part of what is a larger picture here of creating caring schools. And um, the teachers are really a, a critical issue. So here's a poll. Are educators with better social-emotional skills more likely to succeed in their profession and in life? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Is it important for educators to take time to take care of themselves to nurture their well-being? Yes? Okay. Will educators be better prepared for their career and life if their social-emotional skills are nurtured through their careers starting in pre-service? Okay. Then, why aren't we doing it? How do we ensure that educators' social emotional skills are nurtured in pre-service and in their districts, right? This is the giant hole here in the whole process. And this is about the crisis of teaching, which I'll come back to. Tish Jennings and I wrote this paper, it's highly quoted, uh, called The Pro-Social Classroom, in which we say, look, if you want students' social, emotional, and academic outcomes, what's important? Healthy classroom climates, we know that, right? Kids learn more when the classrooms are healthy. Healthy classroom climates include healthy teacher-student relationships, effective management skills, and effective SEL implementation. But who's doing all this? Right? It's the teacher. The teacher is the driving force here. Right? Teachers' own social-emotional skills, their ability to manage stress, their well-being, their connection to other teachers in the building, these are the critical issues that drive this whole process. So we began to think about this. I, I mentioned this afternoon, I was in a meeting uh, in Dharamsala with the, the Dalai Lama on destructive emotions in, in 2000. I was talking to him about emotional development in the brain and children and what we can do in schools. And about halfway through the meeting, he turned uh, to me and, and a Buddhist monk and a neuroscientist, and he said, if we know so much from the East about the nature of the mind, and we know so much from the West about relationships and emotions, why aren't there curriculum for normal adults to help them become more caring and compassionate? A really good question, isn't it? So we realized it wasn't a question, it was actually a task he was giving us. And uh, we began a very slow process over many years of working on this. And we thought there were three groups of people that uh, have high social capital and high stress, which are nurses, emergency workers, and teachers. Right. So we started with teachers, and we started with a curriculum. We didn't know much about what we were doing at the beginning. Uh, actually, in San Francisco in, uh, in, in the uh, early 2000s, and slowly this evolved over time with lots of work into what's now called the, uh, the care curriculum, cultivating awareness and resilience in education. And through a series of studies uh, uh, funded by the Department of Education through the Institute of Educational Sciences, we've done a series of randomized trials uh, and, uh, and looked at the effectiveness of uh, doing work with teachers on their own well-being. It's not about curriculum, it's not about um, how they teach in the classroom, it's about their own development. And the idea is to increase teachers' well-being uh, and increase their mindfulness, their, their use of positive affect. Teaching is really rough, right? We know, we know the rates of, of retention, we know how stressed teachers are. Teaching is now, with nursing, uh, the, the highest, most stressful profession in the United States by the Gallup poll. And we want to decrease burnout and, and negative affect because no one is a good teacher when they're feeling burned out, right? So <clears throat> care has been done in different ways, different places, but usually it starts with a, a two-day or one-and-a-half-day retreat, and then a day later, and a day later. Again, you want to do something across the year and not just at one time. And there's some phone email coaching. Uh, we're teaching teachers about their own emotional awareness. What, what, how, do, how do they relate to emotions like anger and sadness? What, what triggers them in the classroom with kids? Right? Uh, their own emotional awareness and what they can do about that. We teach them some mindfulness practices. We teach them some empathy and, and compassion practices, what we call caring practices. And we teach them how to apply this to be present in a different way in the classroom. What does it mean to be present when you're in the classroom? What does it mean to have a real presence with kids, to be with them? Not to be in your mind 10 other places, but really to be there. We teach them a lot about how to listen in a different way to children, in a way that children will see, feel like they are seen and heard, and, and, and it helps them develop relationships. And so we've done this in multiple studies. We did a large study, 226 teachers in the Bronx, a third African American, a third Caucasian, a third Hispanic, in schools that were about 85% uh, Hispanic Latino. And, uh, and we've done it in rural Pennsylvania, and we've done it in Croatia. 
in all the studies, we basically find the same things. Uh, in the randomized trials, teachers all want to be part of this. They're randomized, either get it or wait a year. We see lower rates of stress. Teachers feel more efficacy as teachers. They feel less time urgency. They feel less rushed, even though their schedule didn't change at all. No changes in their schedule. Lower rates of depression and anxiety. Greater compassion for themselves. And um, uh, in the study in New York City with 226 teachers, we'd observed altered classrooms with observers that were blind to condition and showed that the teachers who were in care uh, improved in the quality of their instruction, even though we didn't teach them anything about instruction. But what do you think? If teachers are feeling better, do they teach better? Do you teach better on a day in which you feel better? Right? This, is, this should be obvious to us all. Why do I have to do these trials to, to prove this stuff? I feel like I'm proving the obvious, but not, not because this doesn't get any attention, right? So let's go to principles. Principles value SEL. There's a new survey that's done recently showing that 74% uh, that of principals say these skills are definitely teachable. 69% uh, of principals say that they're very committed, and the rest say they're fairly committed to doing SEL in their schools. But only 33% of principals say they're implementing SEL school-wide. I think it's an overestimate because it's a self-report. If I talk to their teachers, I think it would be half that rate probably. And only 25% of principals meet any benchmarks that show that the implementation of their SEL is high quality, that there's ongoing training, that teachers feel competent at doing it, et cetera. Okay? So we can think about the pro-social school instead of the pro-social classroom. Got the kids' outcomes. We've got a healthy school climate, which healthy principal-staff relationships, healthy organizational culture, effective principal-community relationships. What does that depend on? The principal's own well-being and the principal's own skills. Okay? What's the one thing that principals are not trained in or not certified about uh, in becoming a principal? How to be a pro-social leader of a building how to make sure that every child and every adult in that building, including parents, are seen and recognized and welcomed and respected. Now, some principals naturally do this. 20%, I'm guessing. I'm being, I'm being a little bit liberal about this. Okay? But there's nothing in principals' training about how to become a pro-social leader, how to create community in a way, uh, not just among the teachers, but among the teachers, the staff, all of the staff in the building, uh, families, etc. Thoughts about this? No? You'll agree. Okay. And principals are even more stressed than teachers. As you probably know, principal retention, principal turnover rates are unbelievably high. They're higher than teachers. Um, I spend a lot of time just bringing principals together and talking with them, with them. And the first thing that they say is that they're, they're, they're really lonely, that they are by themselves all the time. <coughs> Their management, not labor, as one principal said to me, she said, the longest walk I take during the day is to the teacher's lounge. Right? Um, parents don't come by to say how wonderful they are, and neither does the superintendent. Right? Rarely. Right? And um, the work-life balance is totally out of whack for most principals. They just don't know how to manage it. It's a 20. It's a, you don't turn your phones off till midnight or your email because you feel responsible for everything that happens. It's a really, really tough job. So what do principals get in terms of this? Well, nothing, right? They don't get any training how to, how to, how to do this and how to manage it and how to create a sense of community. Uh, and so we've begun to do this work with principals now. Uh, this is a great, great cartoon. <laughs> Not going to work, probably. Uh, in fact, one of the most important things that we've done is just bring principals together and let them begin to talk with each other, even just venting. Even a little, little bitching isn't a bad thing necessarily. Uh, but learning to share and learn from each other uh, and, and also learning more about themselves. What triggers them during the day in the building? What do they do to create community in a building? What are the new ways that they could think about doing that? There's so many ideas that are out there uh, that are, un are unknown. So. We've got issues to think about what we do at the classroom level, but we really need to think about this in terms of systemic change. What is it that teachers need that they don't have? Why are so many teachers so frustrated and so out of whack and wanting to leave the profession? How many of your teachers, and how many, what percentage of the teachers do you think in your building 
would say that they'd leave if they had another job. 30%? 50%? Maybe even more, which means that we've created conditions that are not right for education, for, for the kids, or for the adults, right? Am I being too negative, or am I talking reality here? Okay. So how do we become more systemic in our thinking? We can't solve this by buying curricula alone. This doesn't solve the problem. And it doesn't solve it by having a volleyball game once a week among the staff, okay? Uh, so we need to think about a theory of action, right? What is it we need to do? And this is what sort of Castle's district guides, Castle school guides are about. We need to establish a shared vision. We need to assess what the resources are now and how we're spending them. We need to embed professional learning for the adults, the adult SEL. We need to adopt evidence-based programs that are done with quality, where we have enough budget to actually do them well rather than just by curriculum. Uh, we need to integrate it school-wide. Right? So it's not just in the classroom, it's in the hallways, it's everywhere, it's in the playgrounds, it's in the cafeteria. Everybody in the schools are participant. Right? So when we do trainings with PADS, we do trainings with the teachers, but then we do trainings with the custodian and the school secretary and the cafeteria workers and the school bus drivers. Everybody's a part of this. Everybody is part of a common language in building a caring, healthy school. Then we use data. So here's, here's your task. If you're a principal or an administrator, these are the 10 what we call indicators of school-wide SEL that CASEL has worked hard on developing, okay? And I could even leave these up later on if you want. But ask yourself, where are you? Think about this as a, as a rubric where you're, you're nowhere. You've sort of, you've sort of, sort of started. You've, we've been thinking about it. Maybe you've actually started to implement. You're now in fully implementing, and you really got it to a sustainability. Think about those sort of five or six steps on a rubric. And think about each one of these. Because this is what the sort of the big kahuna is. So there's explicit SEL instruction. How much explicit SEL instruction is going on? What's the quality of it? Is SEL integrated with the rest of instruction? Uh, do we have a supportive school climate? I know a lot of you are using climate measures these days. How, how well is it going? What's the next steps? Do we have enough use, voice, and engagement, especially when we get to middle and high schools? Um, is there a focus, uh, a sufficient focus on adult relationships in SEL? Do we have supportive discipline practices? Do we have a continuum of integrated supports? So when you've got tier two and tier three, are they using the common language that was established in the universal SEL program in the classroom? Is everybody talking a, a common language? I had, a, I had a, uh, a clinician that came into a school and uh, she was working with a kid that was very disruptive. And we had taught the child to do turtle when he calmed down. And we had taught the, the staff that, that what was, it was about. And, and um, the child got very upset during a therapy session, and he went, he rolled up in a ball and did turtle. And, uh, and the therapist got mad at him, started yelling at him. Because the therapists, right, and the clinicians, the out-of-school people, often don't know really what's going on, what's been taught in the universal, and how they can recoup it, how they can use it in their own work. Systems for continuous improvement. Is there a way that we're continuously trying to improve these systems? Are there authentic family partnerships in which families are really engaged? And do we have aligned community partnerships with community agencies, out of school programs, et cetera? We think these are the 10 indicators if you think about, if you want to think about how, where you are and what areas you might work on, is to think in each building about where you're at. And this could be thought about at the district level also, but the district is complicated, as you know, because schools vary dramatically. So I think of this mostly as a school-level set of indicators, but it might be useful to think about um, not are we doing SEL <laughs> and are we doing it well, but how are we doing in these 10 different indicators? Right? What, can they, what can they do to help us? Now, this doesn't happen quickly, right? Anything that happens quickly is likely to fail, right? Because enough people won't have bought in, there isn't enough training, and we don't see it as a learning process of total quality improvement. It's really three to six years for a process like this, from exploration to initial installation of ideas, policies, practices, curriculum, to really implementing it, to full implementation and to stay, sustained use. Right? So people that think this should happen quickly are almost always going to fail. Right? Let's buy a bunch of curriculum. Let's 
just do restorative justice. Restorative, if we do restorative justice, now, we are, now we're an SEL school. Well, what can I say? It's not going to work. So what's the implications of all this for practice and policy? First, SEL works. There's lots of positive outcomes we can see from, from good SEL work, including academic achievement. And we see the outcomes across grades and contexts. Uh, I didn't talk about equity yet. I'm sure there's going to be some equity questions. But um, if there's one, uh, one thing we know so far about SEL is that it's been done more in disadvantaged contexts of, of ethnic and cultural children than it has been in suburbs. Almost all of the good research is in urban contexts. And uh, there is no data that I know of, none at all, that shows that there are differential outcomes by ethnicity. Okay. Now, is that good? Is that, an, is that an equity outcome? We can talk about how we define equity later, I guess. But uh, th it's clearly the case that uh, almost all uh, good SEL programs have been tested mostly in urban environments, uh, and that's where, they, where the outcomes have been shown. SEL is doable. Well-trained teachers show strong outcomes. And teachers won SEL. There's a great report called The Missing Piece, which is uh, interviews with many teachers across the country. And one thing that teachers say is they want more of it, they know they need it, and they, most of them feel that they're not well trained. And there's a new principal report that Castle just released about two weeks ago showing that principals believe that teachers are not trained well enough in how to do SEL, and that they see this as one of the problems that they're experiencing. SEL is a good economic investment. But it needs support. It requires strong leadership and quality professional development. It requires effective planning to have effective implementation. Oftentimes what happens is the school gets a grant. They, call, they look through the CASEL guide. They pick a program. They call them up. Um, teachers haven't voted or decided this is what they want to do. The teachers go to training. They don't know why they're there. The training happens. The training ends. And they go back to doing what they were doing before. I, I've been there. I, I understand all this. <laughs> And, uh, and it requires greater support in terms of federal and state policies. And uh, it's great to see your new SSA Act. Fantastic. So here's the holistic picture. We want to support effective social and academic development, but we also want to support well-being. And I think there's three major components to this. We want to do social and emotional skill development. That's what the evidence-based SEL is about at any, any grade level. We also want to have effective conditions and, and for learning and norms of caring in schools. That's about policies and practices. But if we forget about teacher and administrator well-being and their own awareness, um, we're going to miss the boat. What we're going to see is continual churn of let's try this program for a couple years, then let's try this program for a couple years. But the program is not the solution. The solution is systems change that supports the well-being and awareness of the adults in the building. And when that happens, then the evidence-based programs are going to have much more powerful effects. We know that's the case. And I'm involved now in a new uh, I-3 trial. It's a federal government innovation trial uh, with 40 schools in Chicago, in which all 40 schools will get, in this case, the PADS curriculum, and half of them will get care. Because the idea is that as teachers' well-being improves and they become more aware, they'll teach SEL programs better. Do you think that's going to be the case? Yeah, I think so too, but no one's ever tested this question. If we combine the two, we teacher well-being and teacher SEL at the same time as student SEL, will we uh, synergize the two processes? In fact, the, 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 the uh, project's called Project Catalyze, because we think they'll catalyze each other. So, CASEL's vision is educators, students, families, and communities working together to support healthy development for kids. Children and youth are engaged as active learners who are self-aware, caring, respectful, connected, academic achievers, and are contributing in positive ways to their communities. This is what we want in a healthy democracy. It's these skills that are the nature of what schooling is about. Am I a John Deweyite? <laughs> Dewey said all this in 1892 and 1893. He was the great visionary of all this. And um, thank you. <laughs> Well, you have a sense already that there are no answers. <laughs> Come on, relax a little bit. It's true, right? 
there are no there are no clear answers to all these things necessarily, but I'll, I'll pick a couple of them. We can talk about them. Some really thoughtful questions. <clears throat> One question is: We know change takes three to seven years to embed in the culture and practice of an organization. Often there's an implementation dip. It's a really good point. And schools abandon the initiative before the results could be seen. How do we get fidelity from all staff to sustain the effort? Okay. Well, implementation dips happen because people get excited and they start doing things. So one of the things you have to do is you have to recognize there's an implementation dip. And let everybody know it. That this is gonna, it's gonna, there's going to be a waxing and waning. And <clears throat> you have to make things live. So this is where consultation can be really helpful. So that, uh, for example, uh, in our work with schools, we sort of know this is going to happen, and we add new ideas as time goes on. And those ideas don't come from us. It's by having the school work together and think, well, what's working, what's not working? What, what, what can we do next to improve it? So the implementation dip sort of evaporates in the idea of teachers empowered to, to, to work to build the next, the next level. Um, how do you get fidelity from all staff to sustain the effort? Well, <clears throat> this is a complicated problem, and um, there are, are different ideas about this. Um, some principals believe, or leaders believe, that you just work with the, the, the teachers who are volunteers and let them do the work first and let the, uh, the evidence itself, either good or bad, because not, not, not everything works, right? Uh, lead then to other teachers becoming interested. Other people believe that you need to start as a whole building, and then you have always, there's always resistance. Uh, I can't tell you how many workshops I've done with an unbelievable resistance at the beginning. The interesting thing is some of the resistance is often from the very best teachers. Uh, and they're resistant because they think, it's one more thing, I have to keep my head down, it'll go away. Uh, but some of those teachers become the best advocates in the long run. So you get resistance for two reasons. You get resistance from teachers that are overwhelmed and don't know what to do, and this is one more thing that they don't think they're going to do well, and you get resistance from teachers that are really great teachers. So I think that resistance is just something you, you work with, and um, I think it's better for a whole school to do it together, even if there's some resistance, and just to note the resistance, not to deny it, but to just say, hey, look, some people are more on board with this than others. <clears throat> That's the nature of our school at this point, and we're all going to work together, and some people may do more than others at the beginning, and we'll see what happens. Because <clears throat> otherwise it gets complicated. Otherwise you get, the, you get these divisions in a school, and that's often uh, hard to repair. Okay? This is, that's my experience with it. Um, in your experience, what examples have you seen for strategic alignment of SEL with SWIPS or PBIS and MTSS? Um, well, first of all, I think uh, PBIS is just a simple idea that's good for everybody. Okay? So shouldn't every school have rules that are reasonable? And shouldn't every school track data to know where the problems are? Okay? And that's the, the PBIS data system is very useful that way. <coughs> but PBIS does not teach kids these developmental skills. So in fact, they work together. I've worked in lots of places with our work where it, it, there's a complete seamless relationship between PBIS and, and, and skills that are done in the classroom. So I don't see where there's um, a conflict uh, in that process unless some of you have seen it um, in your own schools. Anybody have had a conflict where they think PBIS and SEL are incompatible? The MTSS is a little more complicated <clears throat> because you want to have everybody having a common language. And um, that means that, the, that it's really important that the, the, either the outside counselors that are coming or therapists from community agencies or the school counselor or social worker needs to really be involved in the universal parts of things. Because um, I, I've been involved in a very large, very long study uh, of highly aggressive, disruptive children in four cities in the United States. And one of the most important things we did is we made sure that everything that was done in small groups for kids in MTSS was completely correspondent to what went on in the classroom in SEL. So the kids weren't getting two different messages. They were getting one language across contexts. And so the important thing is to align them. And it's not that hard to align them. Um, 
but you've got to get the counselors or social workers, whoever's doing that extra work, behavior specialists, to really be involved in the universal parts of things. And um, when those are out of school community partnerships, that can get complicated because um, there's often a lot of unspoken conflict between community partners and the schools. I did a workshop in Pittsburgh where I had all the community agencies and I had these schools. And the agencies are supposedly working in the schools. The agencies feel that no one cares about what they do and they have no say in anything. The teachers say, I am so busy, take my kid, but I don't have time for you. Okay? So I asked them, um, where do they park their cars? Do they park in the teacher's lot or the visitors? visitors? How many of them have been invited to the Christmas party? None of them. How many of them are invited to, to, to teacher meetings? Zero. Okay? That is, if you have this kind of split where you're not even communicating with each other and you don't have a shared experience of the context, well, how are you going to integrate MTSS and the universal in the classroom? So if, if, if people want this to work, there has to be a really conscious decision to make this work. And that means that people have to get to know each other, spend time with each other. The outside uh, collaborators need to be in the classrooms and see what goes on. There has to be time for teachers to actually spend time getting to know them and what they're doing with the kids. Otherwise, it's an uncoordinated system and it's unlikely to work very well. Have, have anybody had that experience? Yeah. It's not e if this was an easy problem, it would, it, it would be easily solved. But it really takes a conscious set of intentions to really develop these relationships between everybody, and that means that the people have to spend time doing that. So that's what the alignment's about, I think, for, for me. Can you sketch out what SEL looks like in a high school? No. <laughs> well, uh, high schools are really different places, and, and, and high schools themselves, uh, you know, every high school itself is different, too. So it, it, it really depends, and it depends in, in each state on when things are done. For example, when health education is done and how seriously people take it and how, how health education is related to other things. Uh, I um, have worked in a school in which all the SEL was basically done in, in the English department, in which they, they created um, uh, uh, conscious writing and poetry and all kinds of things, all based on SEL concepts. The books that they read, they read not just for character development, et cetera. They read them for the meaning of what was going on in these people's lives and how it relates to their own lives. Um, uh, anybody, anybody know Facing History? Facing History in Ourselves? Facing History in Ourselves is an incredible history model based out of Massachusetts, which takes two events, which is the, uh, uh, an event in the Civil Rights Movement and an event in the Holocaust in which the students go deeply into these two events, but they do it in the context then of what this means for them. What, it would, what was the conflict? Where would they be on both sides of this? How does it relate to their own uh, ethics and ideas? How does it relate to what's going on in their communities now? Um, so that's another example where you'd embed uh, uh, SEL into social studies and, and history. So every school has their own way of doing this. But I think one of the critical things is that uh, because high schools are departmentalized, that principals work to de, uh, uh, how do you call this, de-departmentalize de, uh, de the departments. So that actually, uh, I'm not just teaching physics, I'm teaching children, I'm teaching youth who have an identity, and their identity crosses the subjects, and we need to talk about those things. So the extent that <coughs> most high schools are very departmentalized, is that true? Anybody working in high schools here? Yeah, very departmentalized. It's very unlikely that we'll be able to do the, how, how SEL will look in a school will be also very departmentalized. And there's all kinds of things that can be done. Service learning is one, I think one powerful way to do this. Um, uh, freshman seminars, does anybody have freshman seminars in their high schools? These are usually failures because people do them poorly. But when they're done well, they can have very powerful effects. So there, there's lots of ways to do this, but it's obviously not the same as doing it in, in uh, K-8 to schools. People have thoughts, people have experiences themselves in high schools where they've seen good things happen. Students uh, in our school, in which we introduce them to some foundational language and some concepts and ideas related to social emotional learning. Joe's teaching that uh, class. She's the expert on it. 
Uh, but I think that what we hope to see is by establishing that kind of universal practice across the school and a foundation for the language that we then push out into all of our other classrooms mm -hmm. that we'll all be talking about the same stuff and supporting each other in the same ways. Great. And that's a ninth grade? Uh, or We're a small alternative high school, so oh. it's all new students who come to us 9, 10, 11, or 12. Right. Right. Great. That's a, gr a great example. Other, other high school examples people have seen that have been working? Any thoughts, Claire? Um, I'm asking Claire because Claire's our castle specialist who's here. I've, I've seen a lot of interesting, I guess I've seen a lot of interesting advisory models and I think the ones that have been the most successful have been ones that were done in partnership with uh, a community partner that did a really good job of supporting teachers over time over a course of several years. Um, and and when time has been set aside in the summer outside of the regular school year to really plan what you're going to do with the advisory periods. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably the most effective thing that I've experienced personally. Right. Good. Uh, how do we create the foundational mindset to build, uh, build whatever this is we've been talking about and to implement it? Um, well, it's a leadership issue. That's all I can say. That is, um, when, when, uh, when superintendents are talking about it on a regular basis, like in their yearly talk at the start of the year, when they're asking principals in every principal meeting to tell me what's going on in your school in SEL, when principals in every teacher's meeting are asking for an, an anecdote about something that's going on in classrooms about SEL, this is how it works, right? So <clears throat> if people, people, you know, you know what they say, what, what, what's, what, what's, what's assessed gets attention, right? So the more we ask questions about things and the more we make statements of the, the value of this, the more everybody thinks this is actually real and we're actually going to do it. Uh, and so, <clears throat> for example, I work a lot with, in Cleveland, and uh, I would try to uh, intercept Eric Gordon's superintendent talk at the start of the year and say, Eric, can I see your talk before you give it? <laughs> Go ahead, Luby, I'll ask about yours. <laughs> um, but that's the point. And it's not just the start of the year. It's every principal's meeting, every principal evaluation. Tell me what's been going on in SEL when you're building. I want to know what's going on. Tell me what teachers are doing in ninth grade. Tell me what teachers are doing in second grade. Can I come in and watch for a couple days and see what's going on? <clears throat> so it, sa it says that this is important. This is a key issue for us. It's a foundational value. And it's the same thing at the principal level. If a principal just ask in every teacher's meeting, I want to hear a story from someone about something went on in an SEL lesson today, or this week. It's amazing how it changes the culture of things. Now, there's lots of other things you can do. Here's an example. In the PAS curriculum, just as an example curriculum, we, uh, we have something where uh, PAS is taught about two days a week, but we, we start something called the PAS Kid for the Day. And this is a process where every day, uh, there's a jar of all the kids' names in the classroom. I have had a turn. I have not had a turn. Kids put all their names in the jar. Teacher picks out a name. It's, uh, it's Deidre. And we say, Deidre, oh, you're the past kid for today. Would you like to be the past kid? Deidre says yes. And I, and I say, okay, now let's watch Deidre today and let's think about all the things about her that are interesting. And at the end of the day, we're going to give her compliments. And at the end of the day, it takes about a minute, a minute and a half. We say, I start off as a teacher. I say, Deidre, one of the things I really like is you're a good friend. And then I ask, who else would like to give the compliments to Deidre? Two other kids in the classroom give compliments. Other, others that want to can write them down. I'm writing these down. And then lastly, I ask Deidre to give a compliment about something she does well or likes about herself. <clears throat> I write these down as, as it's going on. I hand it to Deidre with a letter from her, the parents. And it goes home to the parents and says, we said these things about your daughter today in school. We'd like you to add one of your own. Okay? It's done every day in the classroom. Kids love this. They can't wait to do it. But then we do it at the school level. So at the school level in some of our schools, when you walk in, the bulletin board at the start of the school is the staff. It could be school secretary, custodian, teacher, EA, all kinds of people, even the principal. And there are pictures put up for the week. And everybody in the school, students, teachers, staff, parents, can all write compliments about that person. It's culture change, right? Doesn't everybody, wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to see your name, your picture up there and what people say, nice things about you, right? 
it actually is, it's a, has a very powerful effect on a school. It's a very simple idea, isn't it? And there's lots of cultural change ideas like that. That's just an example of one. You might try it. That lead people to start thinking differently. Okay? Uh, in, in the past curriculum, we hand out feeling faces to the kids as they learn new feelings. And the teacher has a place in the, her desk or his desk where they post their feelings. And the first thing in the morning, the teacher's supposed to post a feeling. Kids walk into the classroom. First thing they do is they go over and look at the teacher's feeling. Why are you mad this morning? How come you're so tired? Et cetera. Principal's got one in her office on her door. And she places a feeling every morning. Teachers start going by the principal's office and saying, why are you feeling shy today to the principal? The internal, whole internal nature of the idea that we have uh, internal states of mind, that they're important, that we can express them, changes in the whole school, right? So there's lots of things like this can be done that are sort of fun and revealing, takes a little vulnerability, um, that can create this foundational mindset of change. I learned all these things from teachers. I didn't sit there and make them up in my office. OK. Um, are there school districts that have included SEL instruction in their instructional minutes curriculum mandates? Yeah, we were just talking about this. The Cleveland School District Union has written SEL into the Cleveland School District teacher contracts. So it's actually written into the contract that one of their jobs is to, is to teach SEL a certain amount of time each week. It's a great example of that. Uh, what happens when teacher has all the training needed, but SEL needs of students are still significantly individualized? Teachers can do so much, but perhaps SEL building specialists co-teaching could, uh, could um, be helpful. And I agree. Sometimes, you know, you, you can do so much when you can't do enough. And there are obviously children that need more than just a uh, universal SEL program. But you'd be surprised at the kids who are really having lots of problems that if the classroom climate changes and they learn these skills, dramatically reduce their behavior problems. Um, just look at uh, one good measure of that is how many, how many conflicts there are on the playground where kids are sent to the office. And what you'll see, like we've seen this over and over again in our buildings. We think it's a really good metric that you see dramatic reductions. If SEL is done well, you should see dramatic reductions in the number of conflicts that end up in the office. Anybody seen that? Have you ever tracked that? It's one of those easy things to track, I think. How do you teachers balance SEL needs and curriculum with other demands and expectations of the school district? Okay. Well, there's never been a randomized trial. There have been at least 210 randomized trials in the meta-analysis. There's never been a randomized trial that I know of in SEL that's ever shown that doing SEL compared to the control group reduces achievement. Not one. There's not been one study that I know of ever published that shows that doing SEL compared to doing nothing reduces achievement. Okay. And the, the problem we always say is, well, there's no time for SEL. But when all the trials are done and schools do SEL or they don't, there's never an, a reduction in achievement outcomes for the SEL. In fact, I showed you the meta-analysis, 11 percentile point improvement. So why do we keep asking this question? Why do we keep saying that we're taking away instructional time? I mean, it's just a fundamental th question. Why do we think that this is not instructional time? Right? It's old thinking. It's old thinking, I think. Okay. Uh, well, there's questions about UP for the dean. <laughs> uh, what SEL education is included in UP teacher education? How does UP teach candidates to develop and maintain their own SEL? What barriers exist? Deidre, want to answer this a little bit? I'm not ready to wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can I read those questions? <laughs> yeah, well, what SEL education is included in UP teacher education? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, I think it's embedded in a lot of our courses. I think that um, a lot of the teachers try to take it into what subject they're teaching. I know that um, Nicole Ralstein, who isn't here tonight, and I try to bring it into even research methods by looking at data and thinking about how we actually measure these skill sets. Um, I think uh, Hillary um, brings a lot into her classroom management 
class. I think Randy is going to talk about uh, educational leadership. Oh, no. Right. So this is going on in lots of places in the country in teacher ed where there really has been almost no SAL instruction. So when teachers are out there um, in the world and, and, and they start to do this, it's often very awkward. Um, and I think a lot of schools, just like yours, are building that in now. For example, University of Virginia, University of Pittsburgh, lots of places are now building specific <coughs> SEL courses um, uh, to meet that demand. Um, and um, those courses are not just about curriculum, but they're about relating to kids. They're about the developmental issues and peer relations that teachers need to understand and manage the peer context in the classroom. Lots, lots of aspects to this. And I would hope they're also about systems change, that teachers understand the bigger picture of what it means to come together as a community and work as a community in order to improve the school. Yeah. Good. Well, that's, that's most of the questions. But um, are there un, unspoken questions here? Or are there things that came up in the burning questions earlier people want to talk about? Or are there thoughts on things I've said? Let's get some controversy going? <laughs> well, if I was going to spend my money on one thing, I would be spending it right now on developing the abilities of principals to become leaders of communities. And I'm a person that's done classroom work for 40 years, and I think that's really important. So it's not like one versus the other. But the lack of em emphasis on the lives of principals and their abilities to become what I'd call the pro-social leaders of buildings not just thinking that if their personality is great, they can do this, but really intentionally teaching people and having them learn the skills and the aspects of doing this, I think is central. Because when a principal, uh, he or she creates this kind of caring, welcoming, respectful, realistic, which means that life is hard, teaching is hard, all this work is hard, and does it with the teachers as a community in which they're giving teachers power and autonomy they're not trying to take control, they're trying to give control. Um, I think we see a very different kind of school. And you all know that some of you are principals, many of you are principals here. You know it's a struggle to be a principal. It's, a, it's one of the hardest jobs you can imagine. And the more support you could get to do that better, um, I think is probably the most single important thing I would invest in right now. Now, it's probably not what you expected me to say today. But there it is. <laughs> okay, um, mindfulness. Mindfulness is a big issue right now these days, and I've been very involved in this. I've been involved with this holiness. I've done randomized trials with teachers of mindfulness. You see that have been very effective. But I've just done a high school trial of mindfulness that showed no effects at all. And um, uh, when you look carefully at the literature on mindfulness, what you'll see is the findings are extremely mixed. They are not nearly as strong as the findings for SEL overall. There's a, lots of studies that are showing very small effects or no effects on kids. And um, people use the word mindfulness in a way that I think is really a misuse of the term. So to really be mindful, it means to be metacognitive. It means to be able to operate on the nature of your own mind, to see the nature of your mind and how it works. And this is not something that people do before they become teenagers. Um, kids, uh, when we talk about like 11 year olds and down to three or two or three year olds, and people say they're doing mindfulness, they're mostly just doing self regulation. They're teaching kids how to calm down when they're upset. That is not mindfulness. I'm, at best, I'd call it proto mindfulness. Okay? And that's not a bad idea. I mean, having kids do brain breaks or taking deep breaths. It's not a bad idea. It's a way of resetting them after they come back from recess or when they, or they're losing it, et cetera. But it's not the solution to SEL. The most important thing to kids is how they get along with others. It's how many friends they have and what their friendships are like, and that they don't get sent to the office. They don't, their parents don't get called. But for kids, the most important thing is that they have friends. Right? That's, what it's, that's what it's like. I mean, remember, remember when you were in third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade? That's the most important thing. And the most important thing we can do is to help children learn how to maintain friendship. Because kids that have good friends are protected. And mindfulness does not teach kids how to have friendships. Now, 
Mindfulness can be very useful for adults. I've shown you the work with teachers. And it can be very useful for teens because they begin to operate on the nature of their mind. And they start to ruminate and have anxiety and depression like we do. And sometimes they can't shut their minds off especially with all the cyber world and all the anxiety that's going on for all kinds of reasons in our culture. Now, for high school kids and maybe some middle school kids, I think mindfulness can be useful. But we don't have a good sense of what the frequency and the dosage is, how often they need to do it, what kinds of practices are best. This is at the very beginning. Even though all adults love mindfulness and adults love to do the mindfulness stuff, that doesn't mean that teenagers do. A lot of teenagers actually don't like it. Uh, and so we need to be careful here uh, that, uh, that we don't slap mindfulness on kids because a lot of adults like it. Now, I've been a meditator for over 40 years. I belong to an ashram in India. I sit for long periods of time. My kids would never do any of that stuff. They don't, my, my kids, when they were teenagers, they didn't want to do any of that. Uh, and we have to be careful here to respect the, their interests as well as ours. That, that just because some adults like it and think it's great, that somehow kids should like it and it should help them. And it may be good for one or two things, which is anxiety and depression. But there's almost no data to show it's helpful for anything else. And that's also true for adults, with the exception of some illnesses like psoriasis. Um, so while mindfulness has been a hip and somehow sweeping schools, I would say, let's be very careful about this and to realize that the, the, the most important issue for children is their ability to engage in the classroom and to engage with other children. And those are the skills that children really need, and none of those skills are the result of sitting and watching your breath. Okay? Ooh, I hope I didn't make too many enemies tonight, but... <laughs> I know adults love mindfulness, and I've been an advocate for it, but the science is really important here, and the science is, is equivocal at best at this point. 